Always. We ask the question. What is needed in the world? Is that going to The decision by the USA and UK to invade Iraq in 2003 was met with condemnation around the world at the time and is still haunting its principal architects. On the British side, it was Prime Minister Tony Blair and his Foreign Secretary Jack Straw who took their country into war. Ever since, there's been an intense debate about why they did so. The long-awaited culmination of an official British investigation should bring insights into how Mr Blair and Mr Straw reached their decision. The Chilcot Inquiry, named after its chairman, Sir John Chilcot, will reveal its findings in July, seven years after it began its work. Leaks from the final report, which is 2.6 million words in total, suggest that both the Prime Minister and Foreign Secretary come under severe criticism. Jack Straw was a key witness at the Chilcot inquiry, where he insisted that he supported an attack on Iraq for good reasons, to destroy Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction. But the evidence that Saddam Hussein possessed such weapons was hotly contested at the time and was shown to be false after the invasion. Jack Straw stayed on in the British Parliament until 2015. He's now campaigning for the UK to remain in the EU in the referendum on June the 23rd. He's also lecturing on international relations. At a recent event in London, he talked about Turkish-Iranian relations and how they impact on events in Syria. And it was here that we had an opportunity to invite the former UK Foreign Secretary, Jack Straw, to talk to Al Jazeera. Jack Straw, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. You're here at UCL in London University to talk about Turkey-Iranian relations and how those two countries can help, I suppose, stabilize a turbulent neighborhood. And yet they are engaged in a proxy war in Syria. So how does that work? Uh, yes, they are. It works with difficulty. But if you look at the history between Iran and Turkey going back um, millennia, what you see is that certainly from the 17th century, for 350 plus years, Iran and Turkey have managed to avoid, first of all, any border conflict. The border was settled by a treaty in the 17th century. And they've been pretty careful, although they've sometimes found themselves on different sides in conflicts elsewhere in the region, as they now do in Syria, They've been pretty careful to avoid that ever turning into a conflict between the two nations. And in a sense that, that is uh, overlain by the fact that the Ottoman Empire, uh, Turkey, uh, never was able to conquer uh, Iran or Persia. It was the only country in the wider Middle East which the Ottomans didn't manage uh, to conquer. And so there's been a sort of understanding on both sides that if they got drawn in to a serious conflict, both would be the loser. What is also very interesting to me is how the political and business elites, and they're tied up in both countries, have managed to decouple their commercial and business relationships from their political uh, approaches and the differences which they have in the region. Now, you're right to say that at the moment this is a, a time of risk uh, because of the Syrian conflict and the fact, certainly at the beginning, um, President Erdogan was saying very publicly uh, that he wished to see the removal of Bashar al-Assad, Assad, uh, the president of Syria, and on the other side uh, the Iranians were very clear that their strategic interests lay in keeping uh, Assad in power. And they have certainly been uh, arming each side, and indeed uh, the CODS force, which is the external... More than arming. Uh, no, the, Cod, uh, no the CODS force yeah. of, of, of uh, the Iranian Revolutionary Guard and elements of Hezbollah, which are effectively under Iranian control, have been on the ground uh, in, in the Syrian theatre. So it's serious. Um, but I think now... Um, 
th there is an understanding that both sides have got to pull back. There's got to be a political uh, solution. And the other truth is that the, um, if you like, the bets that President Erdogan took when the Arab Spring erupted in 2011 have not paid off. Uh, so, I mean, I have to say that you know, many of us were naive, if you like, and optimistic in assuming that uh, these spon apparently spontaneous popular demonstrations right across most of the Middle East would result in uh, a democratic and popular governments in Egypt, in Syria, in Tunisia, in Libya, and so on. But with the single exception of Tunisia, that hasn't happened. And so that, uh, that has, the fact those bets have not paid off has relatively weakened the balance of advantage between Turkey and Iran. Let's just talk about Syria a moment. Yes. Your, your old boss, Tony Blair, said very recently that he thought Western ground troops had to go in to fight ISIS if ISIS is ever to be defeated. Do, do you agree with him? Well, what I gr agree with uh, is in his analysis that you cannot fight any war like this simply from the air. Um, that if Th that's what the West has been doing for two years. It has, it has. So either directly or by the use of <coughs> proxies, um, you have to fight a ground war as well. Now, in practice, for European powers to put in uh, troops on the ground in Syria, apart from special forces, which no one talks about, would be... Which they have been doing. Well, I'm not talking about that, but, but uh, would be extremely difficult because it would require uh, parliamentary and popular consent. It would also be actually be very difficult for President Obama uh, in the United States. So what is happening in Syria, for example, is that, uh, as we see, uh, the United States is working extremely closely uh, with the Kurdish part of the so-called Syrian uh, democratic uh, force. Um, and indeed, uh, last week, General Votel uh, went around to inspect uh, these Kurdish forces. So they're using, essentially, uh, the Kurdish forces as ground troops in order to remove uh, so-called uh, ISIS Daesh. Um, and then, of course, putting a lot of effort into uh, training the Iraqi army uh, and providing the Iraqi army uh, with air support and, and other support uh, in order to help the Iraqi army uh, remove uh, ISIL from uh, its redoubts in northern Iraq. If we're talking about ISIS, if we're talking about what you've called a turbulent region, I'm afraid don't we have to go back to the invasion of Iraq in 2003 in which you personally bear a heavy responsibility for the tragic circumstances which still unfold in that region. Well, and I bear a clear responsibility for the decision which was taken. Are you sorry and, for and, that? And I don't result from that. Um, I'm sorry for the loss of life, but if you're asking me whether on the basis of what I knew then uh, and what I judged then, uh, did I think it was the correct decision? I do. I mean, I, I, I went into this with you my, you with, said it was the most difficult decision of your life. W was it, with the benefit of hindsight, the biggest mistake of your no, life? No, because, look, it, you, decision makers facing complex de decisions don't have the benefit of hindsight. Um, I mean, I've also said, for sure, um, you know, it, and this applies to ac across the board in terms of governmental, diplomatic decisions. If you have the benefit of hindsight, there are all sorts of decisions uh, you would have taken differently, but you don't have that luxury. And what two things people need to remember. I mean, one is the context of the time, which was in the aftermath of 9-11, when the United States felt phenomenally vulnerable, and so did the rest of the world. The fact that uh, whilst there was disagreement about whether military action was the appropriate answer, nobody in the international community disagreed at that stage that Saddam, quote, uh, uh, posed a threat to international peace and security because of his holdings of weapons of mass destruction. And that was the key phrase in that famous resolution 1441, which the Security Council passed unanimously in November uh, 2002. And the other which nobody, I mean, that's, that's a lot of history, but which nobody apart from the Americans and reluctantly the British really believe justified an invasion in well, 2003. That, I mean, I mean I you tried very hard to get another resolution. Well, we tried extremely hard, but that, that, that second resolution uh, was uh, to provide a, an ultimatum 
uh, to Saddam, uh, and I, it's a great regret that we didn't get that, that second resolution, although that wasn't for the want of trying. The other thing, just to come to the, the core of your question, which, is, is, which was, I, I paraphrase, but how far was uh, the invasion and the, uh, uh, what happened in Iraq afterwards the cause of all these troubles across the region? I yes, I mean, look, for example, at the links between Saddam's, Saddam Hussein's security forces and ISIS today, yes. well, in intelligence, well, in weaponry, all the rest of no. that. First of all, um, I mean, I, of course, what happened in Iraq after the, the invasion um, has to have had something to do with today's circumstances. It would be. It, it was a disaster. No, well, no, no, sorry, I just, but I'm, I'm trying to offer you a forensic answer rather than simply a series of adjectives. Um, I mean, it has to have had some, some effect. But if you take Syria, Syria um, was not involved in the Iraq war. Indeed, it needs to be remembered that Syria was a member of the Security Council which backed that resolution 1441, saying that Saddam posed a threat. Secondly, the Syrian conflict which erupted as street demonstrations in 2001 as now is a full-blown civil war in my judgment would have happened in any event quite independently of what had happened in Iraq. But there may not be a movement called ISIS that controlled well, large we, swathes of we, eastern Syria. But I also just say this. If Iraq and, had not disintegrated. And, and people need to remember the counterfactual here. If there had not been uh, the removal of Saddam then I think uh, and this is speculation by me but the idea that, first of all, that the region would have been stable in the face of unbelievable popular discontent against rule by minority elites, which essentially was the common factor in Syria, in Libya, in Egypt, in Tunisia, is idle. And we don't know exactly what would have happened in Iraq, except my judgment is there would have been maybe an even worse bloodbath. So yes, of course, there have been consequences from what happened in Iraq, but it is frankly preposterous to suggest that absent uh, the war in Iraq and absent the removal of Saddam, all would have been tranquil. It but the way in which worse. I mean, the way in which you, Jack Straw, justified going to war was all to do with weapons of mass destruction. You said that trying to remove Saddam Hussein. I think was an immoral and illegal basis for, for going to war. It was never about regime change. When we discovered that there were no weapons of mass destruction, if we accept that everyone was acting in good faith up until that moment, did you contemplate resigning? Well, it, 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 the issue then was, um, look, I say, this. it turned out that the intelligence base that we had was wrong. Um, did, did you contemplate resigning? No, I didn't contemplate resigning at that stage. I don't think it would have done any good. My responsibility, as best I could, was to do everything I could to try and improve the situation on the ground in Iraq. But I just repeat the fact, and this is very inconvenient truth, but it happens to be the case, uh, that the view that Saddam posed a threat to international peace and security was universally shared in the international community. Much of the intelligence which we had came from the German uh, intelligence service. There wasn't any argument. Well, they certainly weren't in favour of. No, they weren't. But they, were they, were, they, they, they were They were. They They were in favour of 1441, and the process that set in train. Uh, it's a matter of uh, great regret to me uh, that that uh, did not, in turn, lead to first of all compliance by Saddam, because he could have complied. I mean, we we always made it clear that we would take yes for an answer, uh, and he, uh, and secondly. Uh, that we failed to get the famous second resolution. But let me, let me read you a, a quote to you. The second Iraq war was started to liberate the Iraqi people. Instead, it shattered their country. It was intended to stabilize the Middle East. Instead, it destabilized the Middle East. It was intended to remove a threat of weapons of mass destruction that didn't exist. It was supposedly fought in defense of our values. It led to the erosion of those values. The war has done huge harm to the self-confidence and unity of the West. The war was, with hindsight, the greatest foreign policy failure of this generation. Now, this is a quote from a conservative MP, a centre-right MP who voted for the war. And it, it, it's who, very who, who, hard. Who was that? That's though? David Davis. Yeah. Very hard to disagree with anything well, he said. And I think when, when we look at the cynicism towards politicians in this country and across the West at the moment, when something like this goes so badly wrong, when hundreds of servicemen's lives are lost, thousands of American soldiers, hundreds of thousands of Iraqis, 
and those responsible don't stand up and say, I'm sorry, I need to resign. That's where there's a disconnect and, and a lack of faith I'm, I'm, between I'm so, public... I'm so, so, look, we made, made the... And I've, I've, I've you know, offered endless uh, explanations, and quite right too, because this was the most difficult and most serious decision which I ever took, uh, and, ever, and ever, ever likely to take, and that also applied to the Prime Minister of the day, to Tony Blair. This was, these were agonising uh, decisions. But we made the decision in good faith. Uh, nobody, nobody lied. Uh, no one deceived anybody, um, and on the best evidence that we had. And as I, as I say, the, the, where I have a lot of respect and time for, for David Davis, who's a friend of mine, where I disagree with him in, is in his implication, and indeed in yours, of the counterfactual about what would have happened had we not uh, taken the action we did. Uh, and it would not, Iraq would not have been a picnic, far from it. There would have, and there are thi so th things in Iraq, difficult though it is to say today, um, which have worked reasonably well in the south and in, and in parts of the center. Uh, one of the reasons why you didn't have a, an eruption of popular feeling in Iraq as you had elsewhere over the issue of government, you have, you've had it over things like corruption and inefficiency in public services, is because what was replaced when Saddam went was, roughly speaking, and in its very embryonic stages and with great imperfections, the beginnings of a democratic system. Um, and if, if that sheer minority and the Kurdish, sheer majority, sorry, and the Kurdish minority carried on being kept down, there could have been a mother and father of, of an explosion. Now, OK, it would have been, in one sense, easier for us because it wouldn't have been, quote, our responsibility. But there we are. The Chilcot inquiry, which comes out in this country at the beginning of, of July, it's taken seven years, and then maybe we'll get some of the answers that we're waiting for. I mean, do, do you agree that that's profoundly unsatisfactory, that such an important report takes so long? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, and uh, the inquiry themselves have said that the, the, the cause of the delay is not any uh, delay by witnesses. Uh, when uh, the Chilcot inquiry was established, which was almost exactly seven years ago, in the early summer of 2009, um, the anticipation from the inquiry I th it was that it would take, I think, less than two years. Now, it, f for sure, uh, especially for the families of bereaved service personnel and other civilians who, d who died in, British civilians who died in Iraq, um, it has been an agonising wait. I mean, you, you gave evidence to them six years ago. I'm surprised you can even remember what, what you well, told them. Uh, well, I can. Um, but, but no, I gave evidence to them on three occasions. Um, and the last occasion um, was, in fact, the last occasion on which... Well, the, that was five years ago. But uh, they took evidence from any uh, witness, which was very early February 2011. Are you very nervous about what this report might say? Um, I've set out my... Uh, evidence uh, at some, some length, some would say considerable length, and I look forward to the report. You say that you're haunted by the Iraq war, that implies regret. No, I, well, I mean of course I regret the, 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 uh, the fact that, I mean, above all, that the basis on which we made the decision, uh, w which was that there were extensive holdings of what we knew Saddam had had, which have uh, holdings of, of, of uh, very dangerous chemical and biological uh, weapons were not found uh, and I've... Well they didn't exist, it wasn't that they no, weren't no, no, found. No, 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 sorry, with great respect, no, this is a fundamental error by you and by others. The reason that the international community said in terms in a United Nations Security Council binding resolution in November uh, 2002 that Saddam posed a threat to international peace and security because of his holdings of, because of his holdings of uh, weapons of mass destruction and indeed his long-range missiles, missile systems is because that is what they'd had uh, and one of the things that convinced me to support the military action was that as late as, as it turns out, the 6th of March 2003, just 12 days before we had to make a decision uh, to go to war, Hans Blix had published a 170-page document setting out uh, the 29 separate chapters of unanswered questions about what had happened to Saddam's weapons of mass destruction. So the fact that he had had all this stuff was incontrovertible and Saddam had offered no explanation at all 
about what had happened to it. And he could have done, and, and, and he could have uh, allowed the inspectors in, which he refused to do. He could have allowed us to interview, or the inspectors, to interview the scientists, but he failed to do so. Uh, it, let's talk about your, your old boss, Tony Blair. I mean, in, it's very difficult for him now to appear in, in many places in public. He, he hobnobs with you know, repressive governments like Kazakhstan, with, with, the, with the Murdoch family. He, he seems a, he's come a long way, and it's a very strange and, I suppose, pathetic journey in some ways, from being a Labour Prime Minister to, to what he is now, this sort of wealthy man who's, who's, on, who's on the run. What, what, what do you make of his journey? Sorry, you're, so you're, that, that's your point, is it? Well, well that's my observation. I, I, I mean, do you consider him a friend? Yes, I do. Uh, and I think that he was an extremely effective Prime Minister. And um, uh, it needs to be remembered uh, that after a pretty terrible period in the 70s uh, for the Labour Party, um, when we had a government on a knife edge uh, for five years, it was good government, but it was right on a knife edge, and then 18 years of the most depressing opposition. Uh, Tony won three elections, and the government which he led, of which I was privileged to be a member, was a very good government uh, and did, did great things. But and isn't part of his legacy, and, and yours, the fact that Labour is now led by a man, Jeremy Corbyn, who you consider unelectable, incapable of winning a general well, election? Such was the disillusionment with the Blair legacy. Well, I understand. Uh, I mean, that, you know, that. that <laughs> I put it this way, yeah, of course there were, there were people, Jeremy Corbyn, I've always got on with fine, I happen to have political disagreements with him. But well, uh, you, no, you said he could never win an election. Uh, well, I, and uh, no, let us see whether I'm right or not about that, I hope he does, uh, but uh, let us see. Um, but I think that it's unfortunate that there's been a kind of rewriting of history uh, around Tony. What people do when they f retire um, is a matter for them, and we each make our uh, different choices about that. Um, I mean, so far as I know, he's not hobnobbing with the, with the Murdochs. Um, and uh, as for, um, you know, he can't be seen in public. He gave a perfectly public, uh, well, it, it took part in a public debate organised by the Progress magazine, I think only last week. So, um, uh, and like any other Prime Minister, he requires constant police protection. I mean, thankfully, despite the jobs I did. Uh, I don't require constant police protection. I can walk around the streets and talk to people very freely. We're, we're running out of time, Jack, so I'm going to ask you about the, the crucial referendum which this country faces uh, at, at the end of June. We've just had new figures showing the numbers of migrants coming to this country, to the UK, that England's population is going to grow 7.5% in the next 10 years. It will be an extra half million people in London uh, within the next eight years. The Leave campaign arguing very forcefully that we have to control our borders in Britain if we are to give resources to our schools, our hospitals, well, our a, social services, yes. our transport. Yeah. But there's a bigger issue here, so far as the EU referendum uh, is concerned, which is, do we want, uh, first of all, to be able to prosper within a single market, uh, and the Leave campaign have got no answer to that. Uh, the economy will be set back, there is no doubt, if we were to leave. And secondly, you know, are we not a country with sufficient self-confidence to continue to take a, our place in the world? And I think we are, and part of that is about staying in, in the European Union. We're talking about prospering. I, for example, I, I used to live in Greece for, for many years, and I saw last summer what happened there. The Greek people voted by a substantial majority to reject a certain economic policy. A week later, their government was crushed, yes. essentially by the Germans. That's how the EU works. Not very democratic, not very accountable. Is that the kind of club that Britain wants to well, belong to? That is a consequence not of membership of the European Union. Well, it is a consequence of membership of the single currency. But yes, sorry, but, but, but the two are different. And of course, you can say that, that we are not a member of the single currency. I've always been unequivocally opposed to the single currency, and I happen to think the euro is, is a mistake for the rest of Europe. But Greece did voluntarily decide to join the euro, and at the time, and they must have realised it was a pretty irrevocable decision, and it goes has consequences. So I understand what you're saying, but we're not a member of the euro, and there's no prospect of Britain ever joining the euro. Neither are we a member of Schengen, uh, and when I was Home Secretary, 
we worked very hard to ensure that we kept our own borders. So yes, of course, there's still free movement of people who've got to come here for jobs. But beyond that, the reason why we have not suffered these migrant waves, as has happened uh, within the continent of Europe, is because of Schengen. Now, what that means, bluntly, is that... You were just telling me that migrant waves were a good thing a few minutes not, ago. No, no, but, but not, not the, the people who come into this country come in lawfully, with very few exceptions. Uh, and what you're seeing in Europe is people, some of whom are distressed uh, refugees, but a very large proportion of whom are unlawful and unfounded economic migrants. Now, we have, far, we have some, but, but we have far fewer of those because we do control our borders. And as far as the European Union is concerned, where we are with Schengen, control of, of those borders, physical control, and outside the single currency, is that we gain the advantages of the European Union without two of its disadvantages. And that seems to me to be very much in our favour uh, and for our future. Thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Thank you very much. Thank you.